In December 2021, Vancouver Sun columnist Vaughn Palmer penned a startling piece about BC's forest industry. His headline read, BC forestry companies expanding at a rapid pace, but not at home. That means BC-based forest companies were and continue to invest heavily in wood product production everywhere but the home province they came from. The flow of forestry capital out of BC is accelerating, including investments made by Canfor, which last year invested $420 million to acquire Alberta-based Miller Western Forest products. And the rush to get out of BC continues to spiral upward. On the day of this recording, Canfor announced the closing of a pulp uh, line in Prince George and termination of 300 jobs. The good thing is it's not all bad news. There are companies like Teal Jones, a BC forestry success story, the largest family-owned private forestry company on the coast, and it's a perfect example of sustainability. Teal Jones is keeping its BC sawmill operating. But they're not the only ones. In Prince George, the Brink Group of Companies is also standing firm, committed to producing wood products here in this province, despite the fact that they don't have a uh, timber license, which is remarkable. John Brink, the founder of the company, is a successful entrepreneur who came to Canada with the proverbial 25 cents in his pocket. He went to work at a sawmill in the north in the 1960s, and that's when he set his sights on owning a wood products manufacturing company, something that he has done, succeeds at, and continues to thrive. Brink says, it was my dream and it is my passion to ensure forest products and jobs remain a vital part of the BC economy. I invited John Brink to join me for a conversation that matters about the state of forestry in BC. John, welcome. Stuart, my pleasure. How, how bad is it? There are a number of things at play here, Stuart. Uh, obviously, right now, this moment, the lumber market pricing of lumber is not very good. And that particularly relates to uh, the inflation related issues. Interest rates have risen. So which is not uncommon. We have been there before a number of times mm -hmm. where interest rates go up because of inflation. And I can think in the 50 years, virtually 50 years that I've been in business, I can count at least seven or eight times that that has happened. Uh, you know, and then the tendency is as prices go up, home building, especially in the States, the primary market for the Canadian and BC manufacturers of lumber is going up and then the home building will slow down. So that is the one thing that is happening. Add to, so that is not unknown. So lumber prices are extremely low right now. The other part, obviously, that plays a role uh, that, uh, not related to policy is that in BC uh, in other places of the world we have been affected obviously for the last number of years by COVID-19 that has had a severe effect on not only the obvious things but also to the supply chain globally and other things related to that. Interrelated to that is that people are hard to find and for people to get back into the routine of normal, but we consider to be the old normal, finding a new normal which is still in the process of evolving, but is affecting businesses in a general sense that have had an adverse effect. So that then all being said, so those are things that happen in, uh, in as we speaking in particular about the forest industry, very typical for the forest industry, it has a tendency of being an, uh, an industry that goes up and down with the market. At the time that you immigrated to Canada, especially into British Columbia, forestry was the number one industry in this province. No question about that. What from your perspective has changed that got us to this Let's point? Let's establish there is no place on earth, in my opinion, that grows better fiber than we do in British Columbia. No question about it. Well, then how Distinctly do we different it? coast and interior, right? Yeah. Then, uh, you know, then in terms of, uh, you know, that what's happening to it in terms of for a long time, 
the industry was extremely successful. It, it consolidated, uh, investors came in. When I came in in the 60s, that's the time they built the pulp mills all over the place. Right. And, and the larger investors started to buy up uh, timber and acquired timber licenses, as they call tenure, and, and accumulated. Uh, you know, up to the 50s, late 40s, around the Prince George area, there were 600 mills, small mills, privately owned. They would go to the bush, to the timber, cut the timber there in a small way, and then shipped it to the planer mills that then loaded it in cars and shipped it to the market, whatever that may be. Then the, the government policy also remember uh, respectfully mm -hmm. that uniquely different in British Columbia from other places in most cases in the world is the timber is owned by the people of the province. Right. Ninety-six of the percent of the timber is owned by the by the province. So therefore, the politicians of the day, whoever they may be, decide what the policy will be surrounding that. In the 60s already, they decided that there should be what they called close utilizations. The mill being in the bush, having a timber license, but cutting up the timber and leaving all the residuals behind. Make it square, leave the rest behind. The government decided, no, there must be close utilization. So they created incentives to bring in pulp investments, but they had to make concessions so that they would get chips to use as a material in the pulp to manufacture pulp and paper. That wasn't a bad thing. That was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but, but it meant that a lot of the smaller operations, they could not put in debarkers and chippers, but that was 10 times more than the mill cost. Yeah. So they started to sell out to others. And others saw that as an opportunity to start accumulating more and more of the timber. Yeah. As we go through the period from then till now, that most of the timber in the province of British Columbia is controlled by about five companies, five, six companies at most, that have 75% of all the timber rights, all the tenure. That means if you have 75%, then you're likely control 100%. Yeah. So then surrounding all of that, the cost has gone up substantially, demands from government have gone up, and, and then being a government resource, up to about the 80s, mid 80s, government would replant the timber that was harvested, and then to maintain what they call the annual allowable cut. Right. Objective is being that, uh, hypothetically speaking, if we have 100 trees and it takes 100 years to grow them, then we want to make sure that we plant at least one or two for every one that we knock down to maintain the annual allowable cut or sustainable. I got to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. Yeah. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So it was still going pretty good through that point. But then uh, Greenpeace and a variety of other NGOs turned their attention towards the forest industry. And the government in British Columbia changed to that of Mike Harcourt. And he brought in the Forest Practices Code. Correct. Was that the beginning of the change in direction of fortunes for the forest industry? I believe that globally the marketplace demanded that that uh, you know that there be a good practice in terms of preserving uh, uh, timber or growing forest, mm -hmm. and 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 there was more and more pressure on government and and uh, and companies uh, to to show that they had good forest policies. That's really started them. At the end of the day, it's the marketplace that demands that if you wish. So did the Forest Practices Code meet that demand? And did we see a shift in forest practices Correct. by forest companies? Correct. It gradually went in that direction, yeah. meaning cost would go up as well, because to everything that you do, there is a cost. Added to all of that then, uh, you know, in the mid-80s, another thing, and, and that to me what is so very important is that 
you know, that we go through all these periods of up and downs and the inconsistency. The most important thing, will we have enough timber as we go forward? Yep. Is there a future in the forest industry? I say to you today, as most other experts would say, is that there is a future because what we have done since the mid 80s, are we growing enough fiber for the harvest, uh, fiber that we harvest? The answer is yes, because another government policy was in the mid 80s that they allowed the, gu- the industry that was harvesting the timber, they must regrow it. Right. It was in their interest then to regrow it as quickly as they could before it starts growing up and, and make makes it more difficult. So, so companies like West Fraser, for instance, are committed to Can't planting two trees for every one they cut down. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what we are doing now to the question, are we growing? Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, what does it mean now? is that on average we had about, hypothetically speaking, about 60 million cubic meters annually. Yep. That was our an annual cut. Add to that then, what happened? Pine beetle happened. Right. You know, took out most of the large bull point, about one third, approximately one third, 25 to 30 percent of the large bull point in the interior of the province. It was destroyed because of the, the beetle. Yeah. Then there was an uplift to deal with that, to take as much economic value as possible. It went up as high as 80 million cubic meters, and then from there on, it had, had to go down to the normal level again yeah. of 60, and then below that. Add to that fires in 2017, 18, 18, 19 in particular. A lot of fires happened that were also destructive. And then a lot of other policies happened. Uh, one of the policies was, uh, you know, by law, obviously, uh, you know, that part of the timber would be allocated to First Nations, yeah. maybe up to as much as 20% of the annual allowable cut by law, and yeah. correctly so. They would okay share, and they would share in the revenue, and, and correctly so. The other thing that happened is that, uh, uh, again, because of global pressure, but also of uh, the enviros and and to a certain extent policy, uh, you know, by uh, by the incumbent government, the NDP government uh, currently, is that, uh, you know, the deferral of old growth, uh, you know, which uh, uh, about 2.6 million hectares was set aside for deferral of old growth became very controversial because the, go- the old growth in a lot of cases included old growth that most, I suggest, people, including myself, refer to old growth seeing those massive trees that are being cut down. And, and the question then is, is that the best economic value? Is that what we should be doing with it or mm-hmm. shouldn't we? has become a problem bringing down the available amount of annual allowable cut in and around the 40 million cubic meter. Then there is another volume that is in, without becoming over technically, they, they call that the undercut that is not being utilized, meaning that about 35 mills have shut down, sawmills have shut down in the last five, six, seven, eight years. Maybe more to go, maybe another three, four, five maybe. Mm-hmm. And then also resulting to it because pulp mills rely on the chips that come from, from the cut, yeah. from, from the sawmill production. Right. And for every sawmill, you can approximately say four sawmills support one pulp mill. Yeah. So the inevitable that would happen and has already happened in a number of places around the province. Last announcement was the uh, uh, account for that announced Prince George's pulp is uh, indefinitely shutting down one of their pulp mills in the Prince George region it just was announced yesterday. Was in my opinion inevitable because the, the, the economic fiber is not available to justify the operation. Mm-hmm. That's where we are today. And, and, and then add to that, what's happening in the market is somewhat separate from all of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that obviously with interest rates being up, uh, housing starts right now are far below where they should be, and, and prices are just absolutely lousy. Right. So combined- Into that mix also was the uh, free trade lumber deal with the United States. Add to that the other one. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there is still, for the last hundred years, that has been a battle between Canada and the United States about access to their market. And the American producers have done everything possible. It doesn't matter what it is. They're going to find some reason or another that should be used. 
Why? Because they're doing, uh, you know, whatever they can to take that out of their market so the prices go up for them, you know, so that's basically what it all boils down to. Unfortunately, what that has done, we have not been overly effective in, of dealing with that because if there was any time, no justification for that, it should be now. Yeah. The other part that is a bit troubling about it that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the larger companies that, uh, you know, are operating in British Columbia uh, have most of their interests not here, but in the United States in particular, which kind of makes you wonder, uh, uh, you know, what flag is on the table that particular day in terms as it relates to duties. Mm -hmm. Second day manufacturers like me and others, uh, you know, are being penalized with, you know, that, that duties are suggested put in place to suggest that the, the access to timber is subsidized. So therefore, uh, you know, it is unfair to the producers in the United States. That's the argument. Yes. Secondary manufacturers like me and others have no timber. We compete for raw material in the, in, the, in, in the marketplace already, a lot of times with American secondary manufacturers. So we are penalizing the future of our industry is in further manufacturing. How can we add more value, social and economic, to the resource? If we're penalizing you for the fact that you add more value, and the more value you add, the harder you will be penalized, the worst it gets for you, like a, a, a medium-sized company like us in the last number of years, we paid $60 million in duties that we should never have paid. Wow. Why did that happen? It's because the politicians forgot or somebody else forgot to include secondary manufacturers in the argument. Before that, when I was negotiating as part of the, that team uh, to number one, two, and three, uh, we negotiated the deal that if they if they should at all, apply duties to a second-day manufacturer, they should do it on the basis of the input, yeah. not the amount of value we add to it, because that then would further reduce of attracting investment. So what I'm saying to you is simply this, that uh, industry, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, why are they not in, investing? A, a, lot of, a lot of the timber now is controlled by uh, five, six major companies, and the industry makeup has changed. Around the Prince George area, where we used to have 600 mills, I'm not saying that we should do that today, but now we have probably three or four. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Premier Eby recognizes that this is a challenge, and yet one of his very first acts in, in government was to disband the, the working group that was going to help try and figure this out. How do we get out of this if we don't have the commitment from the, from the provincial level? And I ask that because there's a fabulous book out called uh, A New Spirit of Capitalism, and it was uh, put together by a, a combination of people in the, under the, the, the banner of the Trilateral Commission. And they're basically saying, you want to solve a problem, if you want to create opportunity and move forward, government and industry have to work together. But government can't keep changing rules all the time so that industry doesn't know what the footing is. Precisely so, Stuart. One of the problems that we have, and I love Canada, I love British Columbia, and I love the forest industry. The problem that we have, <laughs> unfortunately, we have either left, gov left side government, uh, leaning government NDP, or we got the, uh, the Socrates, or the, B as they call them now, BC liberals, which is basically the Socrates. So we either have the one or the other, and once you have the one, we lobby them hard, they change it this way, and the other ones, you know, the, something that capital does not want. They like to know what the rules are and and whatever they are they can live with it but they must know what they are and and in all fairness to them I'm not always on their side but in this particular case to get people to invest and right now the majors uh, you know the uh, and I'm not speaking uh, as the vice chair of Kofi or I'm speaking as uh, for Canfor I'm speaking as a citizen of British Columbia and the second day manufacturer is that we we must look at we must be 
in order to attract investment again, we must be competitive globally and competitive as an industry. Nothing to do with interest rate, nothing to do with prices up and down, but creating consistency. Example, uh, the, uh, you know, the deferral of old growth included, again, when they first established it, without pointing fingers at any group, but the, 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 can, the panel that made the recommendation had about, of the five people, four of them were clearly uh, opposed to uh, uh, manufacturing and, and, and logging of any timber. And so it went too far. And already, uh, you know, of the 11 million cubic, 11 million hectares of old growth that we have in the province of British Columbia, 75% of that is already, already set aside. Now we have gone to the part of the province, if this is the province, mainly on the coast, coast is different than the interior. We're in the coast that virtually, it's not just the, the large trees, but any tree that's older than 250 years considered to be old growth. If you go to the interior, 150 years and older, so you and me can walk to the bush and now be looking for old growth. But what you're looking for, I'm not saying that you would, but I look for is, you know, something that is obvious. Just outside of Pinjot, we have old growth and it is unbelievable, large, beautiful. But a 250 year tree could be this size. And we set aside huge amount of volume in that grouping. So we want too far. They should have readjusted that. And then the other part about it is that, uh, you know, that the, bureaucr the bureaucracy around it has gone too far. So what we must do as a province, I believe, look at all of that again, in all fairness, and how can we recreate confidence in, for the industry in terms of saying, okay, I'm ready to invest. Okay, well, that is the question. How do we recreate that confidence? The one is deal with the issues of old growth. The second one, there is volume that is now sitting, what they call the undercut, would bring us back up, and I'm, I'm, I'm not the expert in the field, but I know enough about it that I believe the numbers are right. If you're sitting at 40 million cubic meters annually right now, we can go as high as 50 and still be maintaining the annual allowable cut. So we have to look at those areas, and then, but in the cost part of it as well, the other part about it is that, uh, you know, in, in, in particular in the northern half of the province, I say a lot of times in my podcast that I do, uh, I do a program, uh, you know, uh, BC4 at Industry in, in Transition is John A. Brink uh, on the brink. And uh, usually what I say is, uh, you know, that uh, speaking from uh, Prince George, the capital of northern BC, and then I kind of look over my shoulders and saying, there we have this beautiful province and the other half. And then I say, hey, hey guys uh, in the south, that's 80 percent of the GDP for the province of British Columbia is generated in northern British Columbia. Mm -hmm. But in terms of harvesting or forest availability, we still have a lot of forest there we, we cannot harvest because of the distances involved, the cost of getting it to operations is too high between stumpage, hauling, we have to create incentives. So what government, precisely to your question, is we have to look at government as being a partner in the industry, not just somebody that has some crazy ideas about things that we can make and put more pressure on somebody that has a large mill or be unrealistic. You know, government has to become a partner. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Are you optimistic? Oh, absolutely. I'm, and, I'm I know, and I know that as disposition you're optimistic, but I mean, are you optimistic about where we're going to go with forestry in British Columbia? I think we have issues right now that we have to deal with. The, the intentions paper mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, announced by John Argon, uh, the, the yeah. then premier, uh, yeah. I spoke as the industry on that, and but I said the future is a bright one. I believe the future of the industry is, first and foremost, we have to be globally competitive, no question about that, uh, and, and government has to be. Secondly, we will see innovative primary in combination with intensive secondary. We're not doing enough of that. 
Right. And that part of that is, and I'm putting the finger at the industry, is their issue as well, and they're not dealing with it as effectively as they should. How do we attract further manufacturing? Don't make all two by fours and spaghetti and pump it down the pr pipeline if they want it or not. We can do more with this fiber than we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. And that means attracting investment and secondary manufacturing. But if you do that, then you have to create reasonable expectations of access to fiber. Yes. And, and that's the problem. That's not what we're doing by saying that you have all the fiber and you're not going to participate in that. That's not what you want to do. Then we have an issue because the people will become much more vocal about it. Mm -hmm. The communities like McKenzie, Fort St. James, Fraser Lake, Houston, Northern BC are going to say, what is happening to our timber or our jobs? How can we invest more money? Yeah. So what I'm saying to you, Stuart, is simply this, and I'm saying that to the industry, and uh, you know, and, and I've always been outspoken about it. <laughs> always has served me right, maybe, yeah. but I have to be honest about it because I believe in it, it's my passion, is that Government has to become an active partner in recognizing some of the challenges, that we need a primary sector that is competitive. I have no problem with the larger companies like the Canfors, the West Facer, and the other ones, but they will have to participate and then saying, let's stimulate secondary manufacturing, either by you as a major primary, either by strategic relationships, or otherwise by uh, people that st that want to invest in secondary manufacturing and have reasonable expectation of access to fiber. But it's happening now a lot of times in the fiber, and especially, I say that the future of the industry is inno innovative primary, attached to intensive secondary, and that, uh, you know, th th that's the future, and that up to 50% of the volume being manufactured and the lumber manufacturers will go up the value chain. 25% of the lower grades and 25% of the highest grades. And the value added sector alone will create as many jobs as the primary sector does. Mm. And I believe that is the future. Well, I'm glad you're optimistic because- Oh, absolutely. There I'm is an no optimist, place. I'm an optimist by disposition, but what you're telling me sounds complex and requires a, uh, a level of understanding that I'm not always sure that uh, those in positions of uh, government authority fully appreciate. There is no place, no place on earth better positioned than we are here in British Columbia. In the midterm, it's going to be tough, you know, and it may not be in my lifetime, but I believe that the annual allowable cut that may be now at 35 or 40 million will go to back up to 60 and will go if we. Uh, put uh, invest into the land base has the potential going up to 90 million and I believe that uh, 10 20 years from now our problem same as it was in Sweden that went through the same thing where they are sitting with too much timber not enough capacity that's where we will go thank you very much you're welcome